Hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia Garrett. And if you were with us last week, then you know that we have been having an incredible conversation about sex trafficking, sexual abuse, pornography, all of it. And we are doing that with the voice and through the eyes of Rebecca Bender, who is a powerful woman of God, who has done incredible things to help others in their journey out of trafficking. She's, she's just got an amazing organization, and we're going to talk all about it this week and over the course of the time that we have Rebecca with us on the couch, on the sessions, I guess I should say at home on the sessions. Welcome back, Reben Rebecca, and welcome back, Christina Reynolds, who's with us for every session. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, gosh, Rebecca. Okay, I want to, this week, we're going to try to get to some questions from our live studio audience, um, because as you guys uh, who are watching with us in the audience know, Rebecca's journey is just so powerful. And, you know, Rebecca, when we finished last week, we were talking about just the gr I, grace. I want to start at grace, you know, the grace that God has to come through in the life of someone who has gone through sexual abuse, but I want you to talk about the grace that God showed you during your sex trafficking. I know that there have to be so many times where you knew that you knew that you knew that it was God who kept you alive. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you, you have obviously an incredible book coming out about victory and I'm so excited to read it. Yeah, it's out. Um, it's out. It's oh, out. just came I out. Get it. Yeah, it just oh, came out. Just, we just had a, I just had my memoir come out in January called in pursuit of love. And so I get to share my whole testimony of what God has done in that. And I'm so excited because there's often, I train a lot of cops. I do a lot with survivors, but I also do a lot with law enforcement. And there's times that you don't always get to share the grace of God and, and what he's done. We just got to be able to get the red flags, help with the prosecution, the trial, the investigation, and you move on. And so I'm always so blessed to be able to share a little bit more about my Jesus journey and what's right. happened there. You know, when I was being trafficked, um, as we shared last week, I got, I, I ended up becoming addicted to drugs by 21. I was in rehab and I got radically delivered at the altar, um, radically delivered from drug addiction at the altar. And I, I didn't know, I hadn't had really any experience with that type of um, faith tradition prior. I had done vacation Bible school at like a local community Bible church, but I didn't really know that God was in the business of delivering people from that. You know, you don't, you don't hear about that as a kid, I think, especially you're like, you know, Daniel and the lion's den is what you learn about. You don't realize like Mary Magdalene and Tamar and there's some Rahab. Like we you don't go through those. And I so related with so many women in the Bible during that time. But then I didn't realize I was trafficked. I thought that I was in domestic violence. And so my trafficker really had me convinced that it was the drugs that kept forcing him um, to force me into prostitution. He had me convinced, mentally convinced that, that was now the reason. At first it was the move, then it was the drugs, then it, you know, and it, and it continued. And so after I got delivered and filled with the Holy Spirit, I went back to him. Why? Wow. I went back to a life of trafficking met Jesus, got delivered, filled with the Holy Spirit, and I went back to trafficking. Why? Why I do you thought, think? I, you know what, I describe it as like a, a tree that there was a lot of roots of, of human trafficking and the issues that take place with um, brainwashing and with trauma. And I went into rehab having my, my fruit of my tree addressed of drug addiction. I went into a drug rehab and it did what it was supposed to do. It did, it, I was delivered, I got free of drugs. I've been clean and sober almost 18 years. But I, it did not address the roots of trauma and exploitation. And so that tree grew back and the leaves just looked very different and the fruit was very different. And I didn't know. Yeah, I'm so happy. I mean, this is one of the things, you know, and I have to tell you guys, for those of you watching, when I met Rebecca, we met through Darren Wilson, the filmmaker. We were both guests on a television program. And when I met her and I listened to her story and I shared mine, the thing that was so powerful to me about your, your testimony, Rebecca, just for all of you, I wanna just quickly share this, is that she just has a very deep understanding of the whys and the brokenness. And, you know, Rebecca, when I, I, I got radically saved, you know, after my first marriage, which was a nightmare and it was abusive, and, and, I, and I ended up, you know, in a prison cell in Italy, gave my heart to the Lord radically. Uh, that's all a part of my first book, Prodigal Daughter, right? But, 
but I went back, you, you know, when I went and got my dreams, started working in Hollywood, I, I, I found myself having to surrender after a number of years of, you know, kind of working in the industry and, and living life after being saved. And what I realized was that the brokenness was still there. And you, you just said it, the root causes of your issues or the root, there were still things that were unconfronted to deal with, which explains how you could get say radically saved, you know, after being trafficked from at, at this point now. So you're 19 when you leave him or you're, how old are you when you grab your baby and you run from this life that this guy has drawn you into, kind of seduced you into and yeah. forced you into? Coerced well, because you there, yeah, because there was this like rehab pause in the middle. Um, usually I, it's like I was there almost almost six years. I took uh, basically a, a year in between to go to rehab and get radically saved. And so the book in. So I went in between 18 and 19. I got trafficked. I was able to get out. Um, 2007, I ran to London. It was December 31st, 2007. So I was 28. By the time um, I was able to finally, was that, was that, is that? how old you are in those seven? I don't even know. I could have been, I have to do the math. I think I may have been 27 and then I went to London and then I got home at 28. So I have to like, look at the timeline because there were so many like stops and starts that you forget. Like, was it 20 there or 21? And then 28, I think when I ran 27, 28, when I ran to London and then 28, 29, almost when I came back to the U S and, and so during that time though, yeah, you're right. It's like going back into a life of, of sin filled with the Holy Spirit was really hard. Um, I remember feeling like I could see things that I, I, that haunt, have haunted me before. I'm free of that now, but I can remember seeing things that were really frightening and just the grace of God to be able to pray. Um, during my time in rehab, I also really learned how to pray, how to intercede on my own behalf. And I could remember, um, and I had several traffickers in this time, right? Three different traffickers. And so my, my last one that I was with the longest he would say things like, you know, come home. You left the stove on, come home. You forgot to do this. And I knew that that meant I was going to get in trouble for something. Wow. And I could remember driving home and praying and just saying like, I bind the spirit of rage in the name of Jesus. And I, I loosen the spirit of receptivity and then I was just interceding on my drive home to be beaten by my trafficker, which is really hard for people to wrap their minds around, but I would get there and, and there would be times that, um, felt like it didn't matter what I prayed, but I was still horrifically abused. And I could remember once, and I, I share this in the book, he, he left and I had immediate, I had been, um, had my head slammed into a wall and I looked in the mirror, he left and I looked in the mirror and I had two black eyes immediately. And I remember being shocked that black eyes could take place so quickly. Like I didn't know that was, that's the thing that stood out in my mind remembering. And I remember starting to pray and like, God, where were you? Where were you in the room in this moment? Like, why didn't you show up? And almost doing like your own, kind of like a so-so on yourself, like Jesus, where were you in this moment of trauma? And later on, I didn't hear any answer then, but later on, I remember him saying, um, I was stopping him from getting a knife. Hmm. What's so important about that comment that I remember him saying was years later, I get reunited with my wife-in-law who we had, she had ran finally after prison and she gave her life to the Lord and, and we get reunited and um, she's telling me this story and she tells me about a time that he hurt her and he went and got a knife and held it into her throat and said, if you ever try to leave me again, I'll find you and I'll kill you. And I started crying, not because of just hearing her story, but because I remember the Lord telling me that he had stopped him from getting a knife. Now, only the Holy Spirit would have known that she had this experience and that was his go-to. But in that moment, it stopped me from, from being allowing bitterness to take root that Jesus didn't come to my protection. And it allowed me to have gratitude that he actually did step in in this moment and that I didn't see it at the time. But now that I walk in true freedom, full freedom, not my partial freedom, that I think sometimes we can think, oh, I'm partially free. It's free. That might be more free than you've been had, but it is not full freedom yet. And when I finally got that, I was like, oh my gosh, I had been so deceived this whole time. But that's the grace. That's the grace of the journey. But I think as we call to walk alongside with believers, um, we have to be with them in their mess. And it's it's hard to do. We want to put on the crown of the Holy Spirit and like, today I will convict you and I have the sash of conviction. And, and that's not our job. We're just called to love and let people be with them in their mess. And that's the grace. All freedom.
you said, full freedom. That's really, and and I, I, I get that. There is a journey to freedom. And I yeah. don't know that we, I don't, you know, I don't know that we actually talk about that enough when someone gets saved, because I'd love to know your thoughts about the journey to freedom, because I do think that a lot of times for young believers, you know, you get saved and you think that the world becomes perfect. And there is kind of often a honeymoon phase, but there's just as often a phase of intense attack and, and deception and confusion. And I really believe that for those of you who might be experiencing that, you need to really understand that the enemy does not want you to walk in full freedom. He does not want you to walk in the fullness of your calling. And so a lot of hurt and thinking that God doesn't see you, even though you're praying or that he's not helping you, even though you've called out to him, those are lies and they're deceptions. He's saving your life. And I, I do believe that, you know, you said it, Rebecca, there are just so many times where you got to, you got to get a glimpse of how he had saved you years later you know, by, by being able to connect that audible comment, you know, I'm, I, I, I stopped him from getting a knife, mm -hmm. but so many others don't, right. you know? So can you talk about your journey to freedom and, and just, cause I can sense that it was very important for you to understand that he had been there with you. You know, I, working with people in the fight against human trafficking has been one of my greatest honors and joys to, to be in this field and in this work. Um, but one thing I can say that I see happen a lot with people, church, especially people in church, is that they, they imagine that they're going to help rescue victims, give them Jesus and their GED, and somehow it all magically comes together by letting them know all the things they've done wrong. And that is it's just, it's funny sometimes when you, when you watch it and you're like, you do remember there's like a journey. You do remember you can just love people and teach them more about him. And the Holy Spirit will gradually, as it gets, as, as the light gets stronger, it will push out the dark. And you don't have to continually correct people on their journey. Is there a time biblically when it says, call your brother back on, onto the path? Yes, there is a time. There's also a time to just love your neighbor more as much as you love more than you love yourself and, and allow the Holy Spirit to do, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling there, there, you can do that. You can love people. And it's also, I think about reminding people of their goodness, um, reminding people of the gifts and the talents that have been left dormant for far too long, reminding mm. people that the lies that have taken root in their heart are, are that they're lies. They're not truth. And what does God say? And teaching them to fight. That's why in, the, in, in Exodus, the children of Israel, they could have been taken the short road, but God took them the long route because the first time they faced a battle, they would turn and flee. And he knew that. And he wanted to teach them how to fight. We are called to help survivors of trafficking learn how to fight. And that's not just the people we serve. That can be the people that you serve. And, and anyone that's listening, not just you personally, obviously, Cynthia and Christina, but people listening, whomever God's calling you to help, um, teach them to fight spiritually, teach them to fight, to know truth, teach them to fight, um, to, to identify the counterfeit. Um, that's, what's going to sustain them. That's, what's going to keep you walking, walking in your calling long-term, um, is learning how to fight your battles. Right. And so crucial. Sorry. No, it's, it's, it's powerful. Christina, I, yeah. I, put my, I had to put my glasses on you guys because I was oh. looking at some of the comments and questions, which are so <laughs> powerful. So Christina, why don't you ask one and then I'll take a question from right. some of our live studio audience who's watching us today. Yeah, for, for one, thank you for sharing. I think your testimony is so powerful. I so agree with your point about the journey. I mean, that goes for anyone walking in any sort of life experience, whatever that looks like. Um, my question for you is, because I know that now you're happily married, you have four daughters. I mean, that's amazing that God restored everything, you know? Yeah. So can you share a little <laughs> bit? I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking like advice for women who have been through abuse or trauma, how, like how to get that healing to where you can actually operate in a healthy family life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I feel like sometimes the trauma can replay in your mind, can start, uh, there's the temptation to project that trauma onto like maybe your husband or mm -hmm. in different situations. Like how, honestly, how do you get through that? Yeah. 
I mean, I, this is a question we get a lot and this would, from women, especially, right? Uh, two things that help me. One is, um, one is I started really identifying when I felt like I was going into performance mode, just being very honest, right? Which was like, um, am I performing for my husband because I've been taught to perform for men? Or am I trying to actually pray through and, and connect emotionally for myself intimately um, in the way that I'm designed to connect with a husband, not go into performance? And I had to really find where that line was for me mentally and like spiritually and really work on it in some inner healing prayer time and, and act honestly with the therapist too. But I think the bigger thing for me than that was identifying what really is true love because I was so brainwashed and so traumatized that I felt like an obsessive love with my trafficker. Like I would die for him. I, we were going to prison, you know, people are going to prison for him. I'm going to jail. Like we had this love. And when, when I, when I got married to my husband, I loved him. But in the beginning, it was not that same kind of infatuation of like head over heels. I would die for him. Love. It is, it is now, it wasn't in the beginning. And I would cry out to God and be sad of like, why do I feel like I had this more head over heels in love feeling for this other person than I do from this healthy marriage? And I remember the Lord saying, what you felt was not love, what you felt was obsession and it is not of God. And so really trying to identify what is true godly love and what is addictive obsession i think it can get really blended in our minds and we have to really go after the one that's from god and not allow the enemy to bring in wow. something that feels more emotional but is not from god and be careful when we start playing with that with that fire mm -hmm. um and now through a lot of deliverance just being very real a lot of deliverance yeah. a lot of inner healing a lot of sozo a lot of therapy a lot of emdr a lot of all of the things doing all of it mm -hmm. i feel more passionately in love with my husband than i've ever felt about anybody because it's so real and it's rooted in truth and that will sustain you oh my god yeah. Wow. Really one more thing. Cause you mentioned that you in the moment, like you have even intimacy where you had to go, okay, I'm not performing. I'm just, this is true love right here. You mentioned praying through it. Mm -hmm. Like, is that even just another practical tip of just like going to battle, even in the place of intimacy going, no, he loves me. This is true. This is holy. This is godly. The whole time, sometimes I'd have to be like, Holy Spirit, help me to not, nope, I bind that in the name of Jesus. Wow. Spirit, I just pray that you bring connection. And I mean, I do it in my mind, you know, I'm not like ruining the moment for him. But <laughs> for me, That's I'm powerful to battle. hear. Right. No, no, I, I think we need to hear that. I need to hear that, you know. But yeah. the more I would focus and actually pray, then it would my prayers would be answered. The thoughts would go away. I would feel connection. It almost would be like the Lord would answer those immediately, allowing us to really connect, but it takes diligence. And now um, I'm thankful that I get to walk in real, like full freedom. I'm sure that there's still a lot of things that I have going on, yeah, but, <laughs> but it definitely feels different than it did 10 years ago in my marriage. You know, when we first got married, mm -hmm. I was a hot mess and I'm so grateful that my husband was patient and kind and prayer prayed for me and covered me and, and knew that eventually it would get better, but he stuck out through my time of trauma and, and, um, and more, more than trauma, just intimately, I think our biggest trauma was my PTSD. I had a lot of PTSD. Um, he, he'd talk to me one way and I, I wouldn't get like, you hear sometimes with PT, with people, abused women, it, that it would be like this, oh, don't hit me thing, but I would do the opposite. And I, so I, I think an extreme emotional response is, is a sign of unhealth. And so when he would get upset, I would get upset back. I'm like, don't talk to me like that. I'm not going to be hurt again. You don't get to speak. And it was really this unhealthy, extreme emotional swing. And I, I think we imagine only the first and not the latter. The latter is equally as important as a barometer on our emotional, on our emotional health. I mean, Rebecca, you are it's almost interesting. I'm sitting here going, wow, she's singing my song, this is a song I know, <laughs> because it, you know, it's true. And it's often weird to try to explain to people, you, you know, that you, you get married to someone who's godly, who you know is the person that loves you, but you're struggling with the, 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 the call back to your past, you know? And, and it's like what you said, I mean, the difference between obsession and love it's so clear 
and so powerful that you make this distinction. And for those of you watching, really understand this, no matter what you're going through, because it is very easy to get obsessed over situations and over people that are unhealthy, especially when the world feeds those unhealthy obsessions, you know, and, and, and godly obsessions, you know, are, are not fed by the world that, that we live in. You know, there, there are more people that probably, you know, stepped up to say, oh, I get it. I get how much you love him. I get that you die for him and go to jail for him, right? Because we live in a world that says, follow your heart you know, follow your passions. We get conditioned to follow our passions when really what we're supposed to be following is the word of God. We're supposed to be following godly reason. We're supposed to be seeking the knowledge of God. And when you get saved and you become mature as a believer, which clearly Rebecca, you went through, it's that maturity that causes you to say, okay, hold on a second. I'm lusting for, I'm, I'm thinking about in my mind. Right. Something that was really unhealthy and I know it was. And I know that what's in front of me is really healthy, even though I don't know how to receive it in a healthy way yet. Right. And so that's what, when you said getting called back to your past, I think sometimes we hear that as like Christ, what, what Christians say as a new believer, we hear that like, oh, don't get called back to your past sister. And I'm thinking, I don't want to go to the club and shake my booty in the club. I don't know what you're talking about. But what I do is I remember false narratives, right? I right. remember like, oh, love looks like this though. That's my call back to the past. And the yes. again, the children of Israel, who I love because they they really, it took, they, a lot of them didn't get through their freedom, right? And they did the same thing. Like, well, at least under Pharaoh, we had melons and steak. And Moses is over here like, what are you talking about? You smelled melons and steak. You didn't ever, that's not what the slaves Woo! did. They didn't taste the melons and steak. You're remembering a false narrative and right. so we can do that we can remember this false narrative of like oh but shouldn't love feel like this no actually that's not what god created love to look like pray and press and push forward and and fight for that freedom but honestly it, it took me literally going to get a deliverance to feel this type of freedom um and and not everyone walks in that same faith tradition and that's fine to each his own for me that's what worked i gotta tell you guys for the believers who are watching um it is always prayer that heals my marriage in those physical intimate ways always and when i feel like i'm drifting at sea i pray god draw me near to my husband god let me see your love and your beauty and strength through him god make me attracted again because for the longest time, even being attracted or experiencing um, physical attraction, right? I, it, I didn't know if it was right or godly. You know, you get to that place where you want to please the Lord so much that for me, sex was, was associated with everything wrong and ungodly about my past. Right. right. And trying to reconnect it to what's godly about my marriage has, it, it was very difficult. And it's often, you know, sometimes it's a challenge and that's where Christ is the overcomer. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, you're right on. And faith, for me, faith without works is dead. And you say it takes work. You got to put in the work. And, and that might mean, you know, I think what I find in terms of helping people find freedom in general is that it works different for everybody. Um, and it's kind of like learning to hear the voice of God. It's different for everybody. Some people might hear them in a song. Some people might see pictures. Some might, might feel like they get it audibly. It's it's different for everyone. And so what I find is, as I just share all the tools that have helped me over the years and tools that I've heard from friends that have helped them, we just put the buffet in front of women. And now you have to do the work. Go figure out which tool works for you. Try praying when you're not feeling attractive or attracted. Try praying when you're feeling like you're performing, not connecting. Um, go get some therapy from an actual therapist and work through the neurology in your brain because God created your brain to work a certain way. Figure out what neurological patterns are and how you can work actively at breaking and redirecting neurological connections, especially those that have been built on trauma. That's a real actual therapeutic model through EMDR and other forms of brain spotting. Do the work and pray and, 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 and then eventually like you'll find your rhythm you'll find what works for you you'll find out that this works better than this and and so it does take work and and i just want to encourage people to like don't be afraid of hard work step in you're worth it your marriage is worth it your freedom is worth it and the call of god on your life is worth it so like step up to the buffet figure out what's at the table and try it all <laughs> wow amen amen i mean I just, I, I, 
I almost okay. So I got to ask you: Will you will you stick around for a, a, another week and talk to us some more? Because I want to get to some of what's going on today as well and talk ab about your organization and sure. um, what you're doing. Because I think what you're doing is incredible, and I think that we all need a second chance in life. You know, and the things that we've been talking about. Sure, Rebecca Bender, our guest, has been sex trafficked, and she's overcome that. But the themes and the things that we're talking about are things that impact all of us, you know, whether we're single or married. They're, they're, they're things that you don't have to have been sex trafficked to experience some of the brokenness and some of the ways that these things play themselves out. It's, it, the enemy is a liar. You yeah. know, he's a liar and he's a deceiver and recognizing him and how he works against your life is critical. So uh, we're gonna break for this week we're going to pick up next week and we're going to speak some more with Rebecca Bender, our guest and friend and an amazing woman of God and sister in Christ. I love you guys and I will see you next week. He's the kindest one I know. And he'll never let me go. Jesus, he's the kindest one I Hi everyone, I'm Cynthia Garrett and I just wanted to um, stop and encourage you to pick up a copy of my new book, I Choose Victory, Moving from Victim to Victor. And it is about all of the ways in which everything about your life and this world tries to make you live your life as a victim. And we don't wanna do that. We wanna learn how to choose victory. So you can get your copy online and at booksellers everywhere. Go to ichoosevictory.com and find out everything you need to know. I'll see you soon.